So I was asked a question this morning by a guy in one of the social media groups that we're in online, and I want to actually answer it a little more in depth than I did then for all of you, because it's a pretty damn good question, and I'm sure that most people looking to get their bike flash and tuned have probably asked the same one, and you deserve a good answer. So this guy's question is that if everyone is just using the Woolwich Racing software to flash and tune ECUs, how can any one flash or tune be that much better than anyone else's? Now, my knee-jerk reaction to that question was to actually just correct the guy and say that we're actually not all using Woolwich Racing, depending upon the bike that I'm tuning here. I use Flash Tune, Woolwich, Power Vision, Tune ECU, a ton of different softwares that are out there just depending upon the bike and what we found the best results with. But let's just remove that from the equation and assume that we are all using the same software. Which again, we aren't, but for argument's sake, let's just say we are. That is like saying that McDonald's must be just as good as a Michelin star restaurant because they both serve beef. Just because they both have access to the same ingredients does not mean in any way, shape, or form that the end result is going to be anything close to the same. When you're tuning any modern motorcycle, you have three main areas of control in any tuning software. You have fuel mapping, both in the load or the IAP mapping, and in the TPS mapping cables. You then also have ignition timing mapping, and then you also have throttle by wire mapping because most modern bikes are now throttle by wire bikes or at least a secondary throttle plate design like the Jixxers and the Kawasaki's. As I've said about, I don't know, a hundred times before, fuel mapping is the easiest part of this job. And many tuners that we've seen out there, in fact, most of them, can't even seem to get that part right. Because again, it doesn't matter what software you have at your disposal if you aren't properly measuring an air fuel ratio coming out the pipe. This is our wideband sniffing rig that we go ahead and shove these brass sniffers up tailpipes into to get an accurate air fuel signal on the dyno. If there isn't a spot or a bung for us to actually thread the wideband into itself. If you have a sniffer like that too far up into or too close to the outlet of a muffler, you're going to get an improper reading and all of a sudden all the fuel mapping you've just tried building is going to be completely inaccurate. Not only does the positioning matter, but once you get that correct, actually making sure that the sensor is reading a proper air-fuel ratio is not something that most tuners that we've ever seen actually check very often. We have test gas here that we use to check our widebands every single morning because they go out quick, especially when you're tuning bikes with oxygenated race fuel or leaded gases. It just trashes the sensors and all of a sudden they end up one, two, three, four tenths of a point off. And that can make a big difference when you're trying to build mapping for a specific system. And speaking of specific systems, a lot of tuners out there aren't even actually building mapping for various exhaust systems. We see a lot of folks out there that go ahead and get one bike with one system installed, good for you, and then go ahead and throw it on the dyno and advertise mapping for that bike, having not ever once put on different or various exhaust systems or even played with the intake whatsoever to see what effect that has on the power curve or the air fuel needs with that exact combination installed. So then all of a sudden the customer will go to them and say, hey, I've got, say, an R1 with a Graves three-quarter exhaust, but the R1 that they had on the dyno had a full Brox. They're pretty damn different. Let's just assume that that person or tuner has gone ahead and actually done testing and built different mapping on the dyno for each different exhaust when they get their hands on, along with different velocity stacks or air filters to see what that effect is on a particular bike. And they offer mapping for that. Well, if they've only built the fuel mapping on the dyno, which I'm sitting on right now, then they're doing their customers a disservice because the air fuel needs of specifically something like an R1 or a ZX-10 or a Dixie 1000, anything with a Ram air intake system is going to be quite different on the track at 180 miles an hour than it is sitting in this room on a dyno. Which is why it's important that once you've built the mapping here on the dyno, you go ahead and actually take a wideband and a proper data logging system and then take it out to the track and actually see what the air fuel needs are on the road or at high speed once you have something like that ram air effect to account for. Because even though Dynojet and most of the manufacturers that make all the parts for these rooms that I'm sitting in will sell you as many fans as you can possibly want to help load up an airbox with fresh air to try to simulate that effect, it's just not the same when you're in this room versus when you're on the road. So you've got to do both. And even once a tuner has done all of that, actually selecting a appropriate air fuel ratio target is completely different from one bike to another. I'm not going to dive into stoichiometry or proper burn rates for different fuels or E10 versus E5 versus E15 versus E3 or any of that stuff. The point is, 
is that there is a different optimal fuel target for every fuel, which is why we have to always build our mapping for what's available here, which is just Shell 92 pump gas. All of our mapping here, Tool Dyna Works, for the record, is built for E10 premium pump gas. You cannot just use the same fuel target for one engine versus another. The burn rates are different in, say, something like an FCO7, which is just a parallel twin, versus an inline four, versus a single cylinder, versus maybe a Triumph or Yamaha triple. They're close. But there's a big difference between a 12.8 AFR and a 13.4, and all those engines like to live at somewhere in that spectrum. You can't just use 13.2 for everything. It'll be slightly lean or slightly rich of peak power, and a lot of people just don't know that. Let's assume that somebody knows all of that, and they've used the software to the best of their abilities to select an appropriate AFR target for a specific bike, built the proper fuel mapping on the dyno to begin with, with a wide band that's in the proper location that's been tested accurately, and they've actually managed to build fuel mapping for a specific intake and exhaust combination for one motorcycle. Great. That's awesome. They've gone out to the racetrack and then they've also then verified that that fuel mapping is accurate for their specific setup. Fantastic. You have now about one third of the equation dialed in. And again, we're also using the same software. That was the easy part. Now you've got to tackle the throttle by wire mapping. And again, whether that's a electronic throttle valve system or it's a secondary throttle plate system, it doesn't really matter. You're attacking it the same way. It's easy to go ahead and remove the restrictions in the software, because again, we're still all using the same software in this theoretical argument. And you can go ahead and open those things up to 100% throttle right off the bat. You're gonna have a bad time. Most tuners start at wide open throttle because that what's, is making a pretty dyno graph. That's what's gonna sell their ECU flashing and their tuning. Here's the problem. Uh, when you're riding a motorcycle, even if you're on a racetrack, you're at wide open throttle less than 50% of the time. And even when you are at wide open throttle, you can't actually just give the bike a 100% throttle opening right off the bottom of the RPM range, because in almost all cases, it'll just cause a bog. The engines are only capable of processing so much airflow so fast. You can't just increase load that rapidly, say at like 3000 RPMs on a ZX-10, and go straight to 100% requested throttle. You're actually gonna go slower than you would if you kept it slightly closed. So then that tuner needs to spend hours in this room manipulating the throttle by wire mapping just at 100% throttle to find out just how quickly you can open those throttle plates to increase performance off the bottom and through the rest of the RPM range without going backwards because you can go backwards fast. And then if I go over to the software here they then get to go ahead and do that for not only the 100% throttle column that we've got up here but 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 36, 32, 28 all the way back down to light throttle which when you're on a road bike is where you spend most of your time riding these things. And then they should manipulate all those percentages over and over and over and over again and log every single run at 100%, 90%, 80%, all the way back down that rev range until they figure out the perfect throttle by wire mapping to maximize performance at every throttle and load percentage all the way throughout the entire RPM range. And virtually none of them do that. There's a reason that there is over 130,000 passes on this poor roller behind me. And it's because we actually do that and go through that process of building custom throttle by wire mapping for each bike. And it is painstakingly, mind numbingly tedious. And I don't know anybody else that actually does that. But again, we're also using the same software. So it's all going to be the same, right? And once they've done that, then they've got to actually ride the bike. And they've got to go ahead and put on an even more sophisticated data logger that's not just monitoring air fuel ratio, it's going to be monitoring requested throttle versus actual throttle. And then you have to use the own seat of your pants feel and experience or feedback from professional riders on the racetrack to go ahead and see how that throttle responds. And if it needs to be slower or faster, especially just coming on the throttle at lower light RPMs and light throttle percentages to make sure that it's not snappy or twitchy or too slow or too fast or just feels weird or whatever. Once you get all that feedback and you've got the fuel mapping all dialed in and you've gone ahead and created your own electronic throttle by wire mapping, you're still only about two thirds of the way there. Because next you've got ignition timing. And with ignition timing, again, you're going back onto the dyno because you can't monitor whether ignition timing is having a positive or negative effect any other way than by seeing the effect on horsepower and torque to the tire. And you are again, monitoring that at 100% throttle, 90% throttle, 80% throttle, so on and so forth, all the way back down to light throttle. And once you get down to light throttle, you then aren't really looking for maximum performance necessarily. You need to create as smooth of a throttle response as possible. But we just did the throttle by wire mapping, right? No. Ignition timing has just as much of an effect as the feel of the throttle as the electronic throttle by wire mapping does. And the fueling also has a big effect on that as well, which again is why you have to select an appropriate air fuel target 
because you don't want to run the same air fuel target at wide open throttle as you do at light throttle. So you get your ignition timing all dialed in. You've got your fuel mapping dialed in. You've got your electronic throttle mapping created. But then all of a sudden you're riding the bike and it's popping on deceleration. Or it feels weird when you're just rolling on and off the throttle. What the hell happened? Well, one of those three things that you just manipulated caused that because the bike wasn't doing that originally or didn't feel that way in the first place. So now you gotta go back and figure out what the hell just happened, which map you manipulated or combination of maps you manipulated is causing that, and then go back and fix it. And then once you've gone back and fixed whatever issues you've inevitably accidentally created, because it happens every single time, you go ahead and realize that, wow, the bike feels great when I'm on the gas at every throttle position, it's nice and smooth, and all of a sudden the engine braking's different. And I want it to be different. I like the way it was. Of course it is. You've gone ahead and just changed fuel ignition timing and throttle by wire mapping everywhere on the throttle, but not off the throttle. And again, even when you're on a racetrack, you're only a wide open throttle less than half the time. You're only even on the throttle about two thirds of the time. You're on the brakes and off the throttle the rest of the time. Same thing when you're on the road. You're riding in traffic. How much time do you actually think you spend when you're on the gas, unless you're just cruising on the highway? When you're going from stoplight to stoplight, you're decelerating just as much as you're accelerating. And in most of these modern bikes, you have all those same tables we just discussed for deceleration as well. So go back and redo everything you just did, especially the ignition timing and the engine braking mapping or the throttle by wire mapping on deceleration and smooth all that back out. And then let's assume that they've done all that and the bike is now perfect on and off the throttle all the way through the rev range, all the way at every throttle position and load position. Most of these bikes have quick shifters and auto blippers that they come with from the factory. And all of those quick shifter kill times and the auto blipper throttle manipulation opening percentages were all set up for the mapping that you just completely overhauled. And now your quick shifter sucks and your auto blipper feels like shit and is lunging you forward because you obviously turned off the decel fuel cut because this is what the guides and all the software tells you to do, right? Well, now you've got to go back and figure out how to fix all of that as well without screwing up your mapping in any other area to make the quick shifter and the auto blipper still function as smoothly as they did stock or hopefully better. And then once you've gone and done that, you've built all the mapping you possibly can. You've got the fuel mapping dialed in for various, you can take an exhaust system, you've got the ignition mapping dialed in the dyno and test it on the track. You've got the throttle by wire mapping dialed in so it's as smooth and strong as possible on the throttle. You've gone ahead and fixed the issues that manipulating that will create on the engine braking side of things. You've smoothed out the quick shifter. You've got the auto blipper functioning as it's supposed to from the factory. Congratulations, you've successfully built mapping for one single motorcycle. So when you ask how one tune can be any better than another when we're all still using the same software, which again, we aren't. But let's assume that we are. You then have to ask yourself, or the, ask the tuner that you're talking to, if they go in and go through that entire process. What other processes they go through? What other maps do they manipulate? Where do they set the idle? Where do they set the cooling fans? All the easy stuff. But there is no comparison from one tune to another, regardless as if they're using the same tuning software. Again, it's really like asking McDonald's if they're going to be as good as a Michelin star restaurant because they're both serving beef. Now, I can tell you from experience that most tuners, I don't know of any tuner actually, that is going through all of those processes and steps to the length and depth with all the different exhaust system testing that we do, besides us. And once they've done that for one motorcycle, they then need to stay on top of all the new models as they come out like the 2024 ZX6 I've had sitting here for the last two weeks we've been working on. Because even little changes, like the new cams and the 24 models that are now different from the 19 to 23s, have huge effects. And you can't just go reuse mapping you've already built from an older model. Or on something like the Milwaukee 8s and the Harleys, where all of a sudden in 2021 they were using requested torque-based mapping instead of just good old throttle-by-wire mapping, and all of a sudden all of it changed. And none of the mapping from any of the previous model years, even though the engine is identical and completely unchanged, now works, because the EC is different. So all that knowledge and those processes is what separates one tune from another, even though it's all done through the same software. Now, I do a lot of reads on ECUs that customers send us from competitors or they're not happy with, because why wouldn't I? Uh, I'm curious what they're doing. And I can tell you, uh, actually, I can promise you, 100% guarantee you that none of them are going through that exact same testing and R&D process that we just outlined in their EC mapping. They're just not. Uh, many of the tables are left unchanged. They can't figure out why certain things like automobiles or quick shifters all of a sudden feel like crap once they're tuned because they just don't have the knowledge or the experience or the testing time that we put into all these bikes.
carried into story. So I hope that answers the question for the guy that answered it earlier, because I gave him a much shorter version of this long answer. And I hope it answers it for you guys too. If you do have any questions about getting your bike tuned, please send us an email, support at You're more than welcome to call the shop and talk to Pat, but if you're trying to get answers directly from me, I spend most of my day in the dino room. The only reason I even have time back to make this video right now is because, well, I'm covering the shop phone for a minute while some other guys have to go run errands and pick up parts from dealers. If you want our EC flashing custom mapping in your bike, it's all on sale on our website, tooldinoworks.com. And if you do call and I'm tied up in the dino room and Pat's busy talking to another customer and Derek's got his arms in a Harley and Bard's doing whatever the hell Bard does in an engine, just leave a voicemail. We will get back to you. We really are always happy to help. Have a great day.